Happy Sabbath. We welcome you and thank you to the choir for coming and joining us and singing for us. This is our first morning meeting, I think, here at Robinson's, at least in this Mysteries of Prophecy ser series. Some of you came to our Revelations of Prophecy series two years ago. We had morning meetings then. We will, and by the way, we are live on 101.9, so we have a morning program on the air, and we welcome you that are listening on 101.9. We're going to do a quiz as we have been normally doing in the evening. We're going to do a quiz this morning. I don't know if you came prepared for a quiz. You need a quiz card? Who did not get a quiz card as you came in? I see a few hands. We have helpers here. They'll pass you a quiz card if you need one. This is from last night's lecture, the Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy. If you were not here, well, you might still be able to do well on the quiz, depending on your Bible knowledge. Question one, yes or no? Will everyone's life be examined in the heavenly judgment before Jesus comes the second time? Write your answer on the first line. I think we, if you need a quiz card, just raise your hand. We have them. Will everyone's life be examined in the heavenly judgment before Jesus comes the second time? Yes or no? Question two is true or false? There is a record in heaven of all of our words and deeds. There is a record in heaven of all of our words and deeds. Number three, also true or false, Christ was baptized and began his public ministry in 27 AD. Now, well, that was actually a review of a previous lecture. See how well you remember. Remember? Christ was baptized and began his public ministry in 27 A.D. Is that true or false? Number four is a question. According to the Bible's longest prophecy, when did the judgment begin in heaven? You've got to write down a date. According to the Bible's longest prophecy, when did the judgment begin in heaven? Final question is a question. In order to pass the judgment examination, what do we need? In order to pass the judgment examination, what do we need? All right, let's go back and review, see how well we did. You can grade yourself. Question one, will everyone's life be examined in the heavenly judgment before Jesus comes the second time? What's the answer? The answer is yes, including you. Number two, there is a record in heaven of all of our words and deeds. What's the answer? That is true. Number three, Christ was baptized and began his public ministry in 27 A.D. Is that true or false? That's true. Some people get it confused. They thought, well, if he was the Bible says he was 30 when he was baptized. They say if he, if he was 30, how could it be 27 A.D.? Well, they didn't quite get the crossover between B.C. and A.D. right at the birth of Jesus. Jesus was actually born about 3 or 4 B.C., and that's why he was 30 when he was baptized in 2780. Question, oh, there, I gave you the answer. Question four. According to the Bible's longest prophecy, when did the judgment begin in heaven? Well, I hope you got that. 1844. And number five, in order to pass the judgment examination, what do we need? What do we need? You're not sure? If you go to trial, if you go to court, what do you need? A lawyer. And so if you want to pass the judgment examination, you need a lawyer. And who is your lawyer? I hope Jesus is your lawyer. How many got 100% on the quiz? I just see a few hands. Either they didn't give you the quiz card or you didn't do too well. Well, let's sing this song as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card. And those of you that are in the custom of giving an offering or a tithe on Sabbath, you can put that also in the basket if you like. We'll sing this hymn as they pass those baskets around. 
My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. My Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll sing with a glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. I hope that's the prayer of your heart. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. Today is the Sabbath. And we learned about a week ago that this is God's holy day. Isaiah tells us we're going to celebrate Sabbath in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus as the speaker. Can you imagine what that'll be like? And I believe it's going to be very soon when we'll gather from all parts of the universe on Sabbath there in the New Jerusalem to listen to Jesus speak, preach, and we'll get to sing together. What a choir that will be. With all the angels, you'll be able to sing maybe four-part harmony. Some of you have a hard time singing one part. Imagine singing four parts, and listening to Jesus sing, and the angels sing, and maybe the Father sing. That's going to be a wonderful experience. Every Sabbath, the Bible tells us, we'll gather to worship before God. So we should get in the habit of doing that now. This is your lesson as you go out, a colossal city in space, talking about the New Jerusalem. Tonight, we're going to take up a thank offering for our seminar expenses, so if you'd like to give a special gift toward the costs of this seminar, then we're going to take up a collection tonight for that. What's coming up? Well, tonight our topic is Mysteries of the Mummies. And we're going to start at 6.30, not with a health lecture, not with questions and answers, but with singing. We'll have a half hour of singing, and if you have a favorite hymn, then you can still write that down and pass it to one of us. We'll take half an hour to sing. That's tonight. Tomorrow, no meeting here at Robinson's, so you can take your night off. We have a group of students that are working with us, learning how to do Bible work and evangelism. They'll be, we'll be with them tomorrow, but we won't have a lecture here. Monday, our topic will be the devil's mysterious door, a door that many have unwittingly opened. We'll find out how to keep that door closed. That's on Monday. Tuesday, our topic will be the mystery of hellfire, the hottest topic in the Bible. If you're listening on 101.9, be sure and tune in Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Our topic will be the mystery of hellfire. Let's stand now and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath, this day of rest, gladness. You've promised special blessings, and so we look for those today. And we do look forward to that time when we will be able to gather with the saints of all ages, the angels, and worship in your presence. This Sabbath, we ask as we look at these three steps to heaven, you'd make them clear and help us to take each one of these three steps. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for this Saturday morning, three steps to heaven. If there were a highway stretching from earth to the moon, it would take 20 months driving 645 kilometers each day to reach the land of the moon. If there were a railway stretching from Earth to the Sun, an express train traveling at 145 kilometers an hour, nonstop, day and night, would take 116 years to reach the Sun. An airplane flying from Earth to the nearest star, the closest star, traveling at 800 kilometers an hour, nonstop, day and night, year after year, century after century, it would take five million years to reach the closest star. And yet far beyond the sun, the moon, and the stars lies God's home in the universe called heaven. We know that no spacecraft will ever be designed that can fly there, and yet we can get there by taking just three steps. Three steps to heaven, three steps to Revelation's victorious kingdom. We're going to look at those three steps today, and I invite you to mark down these three steps. Before we look at the three steps, let's first review what God will not allow into heaven. We all want to be there. What will God not permit into heaven? You can read the answer to that in Revelation 21, verse 27, where the Bible says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, that's the new Jerusalem, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those whose names are in the book of life will be permitted to enter into the new Jerusalem. Who's going to get in? Well, if you cross to the next chapter, you can read in Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are they that what? Do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may... Enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22, verse 14. Nothing that defiles shall enter there. Revelation 21, verse 27. Which brings us to the question, what is it that defiles? If we were to summarize what defiles our lives in one little word, what would that little word be? Sin. Sin is what defiles us. It's defiling our world. And the Bible says that nothing that defiles shall enter there. Sin actually separates us from God. You can read that in Isaiah 59, verse 2. Where the Bible says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that, you, that he will not hear. Sin separates us from God. God, of course, is the source of life. Separated from God, separated from life, what happens? We die. So to live in the presence of a holy God, to live there in heaven, we have to have the separation created by sin removed. We must experience the atonement. Atonement means at one man. We must be brought back into a right relationship with God. And that brings us to the first of the three great steps to heaven. Step number one, if you're taking notes, we must have our sins forgiven. If you want to enter heaven, you must have your sins forgiven. There are multitudes today that long to have the assurance that all of their sins have been forgiven, but they don't know how to go about experiencing forgiveness. They don't know the process, the conditions by which we can be sure of forgiveness before God. And we're going to make that process very clear today. There are three conditions of forgiveness. If you're marking these, here they are. Number one is, conf is repentance. Number two is confession. And number three is restitution. Repentance, confession, 
Restitution. We'll look at these three. Let's start with the first one. Repentance. What are we to repent of? What are we to repent of? Sin. What is sin? Sin, the Bible defines, 1 John 3, verse 4, as the transgression or the breaking of the law. Sin is breaking God's law. And how many of us have sinned? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's law. And when you break law, there is a penalty if you get caught. You can't break God's law without getting caught. What's the penalty for breaking God's law? Death. Romans 6, 23 says for the wages, the penalty, the results of sin is death. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's law, and the penalty for sin is death. That's what we deserve. However, instead of giving us what we deserve, God offers us salvation as a free gift. Let's read that here from Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We deserve death, but God instead offers us the gift of life. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But, I'm glad that there's a but. But, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How can God give us life when we deserve death? He does it through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we see God's goodness in offering us life when we deserve death, God's mercy, God's love, God's forgiveness leads us to want to repent. In fact, you can read that in the Bible. Romans 2 verse 4. I invite you to open your Bible today. Romans 2 verse 4. That's New Testament. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Did you... Pick up a Bible as you came in. I know some of you bring your own Bible. That's okay. But the page may not be the same in your Bible as what we're using here. That's why we like to have a, a what we call a seminar Bible. It's just a standard King James Bible. But by using a standard Bible we everybody gets, then we can use the same page number. If you bring your own Bible, then the page numbers are all different, depending on who printed your Bible. But if you're using the seminar Bible, this is New Testament page listed there. Romans 2, verse 4. If you're there, say amen. Okay. Verse 4. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee, leads you to what? To repentance. So God's goodness leads us to want to repent. God actually leads us to that first condition of repentance. When we see Jesus dying the death we deserve, his love, his goodness leads us to want to repent. And as you look at the cross, you realize that Jesus didn't just die in our place. It was our sins that killed him. Did you know that? Let's read that from Acts chapter 2. You're in Romans 2. Back up one book to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. We'll read verse 23. Acts 2, verse 23. This is Peter preaching the day of Pentecost. And as he preaches, he had quite a crowd there. They baptized 3,000 people. So I don't know how many thousands he was preaching to. But he says here, as he's preaching his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 23, speaking of Jesus, he says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter said, you killed Jesus. Well, we did. What caused Christ's death on the cross? Was it the nails? What was it? It was sin. Whose sin? My sin. Your sin. So who killed Jesus? I did. And you did. I don't know if you ever thought about yourself as a murderer. But it was your sins that put Christ to death on the cross. Drop on down the same chapter to verses 36 to 38. Peter preaching, he says, 
Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, and we did, was our sins. You have crucified both Lord and Christ. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. In other words, they felt guilty. They were convicted. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And what did Peter say? Verse 38, what did he say? Repent. We're talking about the first condition to having your sins forgiven. Repent. Peter says, repent. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent. What is repentance? Repentance is sorrow for sin, number one, and number two, forsaking sin or turning away from sin. There are many people in the world today, there's, they may be sorry for sin, but they're sorry for the results of sin. Not sorry that they committed wrong. Reminds me, some years ago, I was speeding in America. It's easy to do. You know, they, they have these big wide highways, and they're not so crowded as they are here. And so you can speed along, and they have speed limits. And I was speeding down the highway, going t too fast, and I got stopped by a policeman for speeding. And he gave me no grace. Gave me a ticket. I had to pay a fine. And after the policeman let me go, and I had my ticket that I had to send in with my payment, I was starting to feel very sorry for what had happened. And the Holy Spirit began speaking to me and said, Lowell, are you feeling sorry for speeding? I was thinking, no. I was feeling sorry that I got caught speeding. And the Holy Spirit said, that's not true repentance. So often we're sorry that we got caught. We're not sorry for the sin. That's not true repentance. True repentance can only come when we go to the cross and see what our sins did to Jesus. When I see him hanging there, bleeding there, suffering there because of my sin, my sins, then I start to feel sorry for my sin, sorry enough that I want to turn away from sin to the Savior that can transform my life. That's repentance. But that's only one part of the conditions for forgiveness. We have to repent, yes, that's sorrow for sin and forsaking sin. But if you want to have forgiveness, then you must also, what's that second one? You must confess your sin. The second condition to having your sins forgiven, you must confess sin. Let me read a text to show this. If you're taking notes, you can mark this. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we, what's the word? confess our sins. He, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our part is to confess. We confess to who? To God or Jesus. And if we'll do that, what will God do? He will forgive. If we'll do the confessing, God will do the forgiving. Confession means two things. You can mark these. To acknowledge wrong, to admit that I did wrong. And number two, to ask for forgiveness. That is hard for a proud heart to do. Do you ever make confession to somebody that you hurt? Not easy to do, to admit I did wrong and to ask that person that you hurt to forgive you. That's confession. And we have to do that when we sin. But here's a question that often people ask. How can I know that I've been forgiven? Did you ever confess your sins, but somehow you just don't really feel forgiven? Did, did that ever happen to you? How can you be sure that you've been forgiven when you don't feel forgiven? Well, let me ask you this. What part does feeling have to do with the process of forgiveness? Here is an interesting verse from the new feeling version of the Bible. I don't know if you ever heard of this Bible. There is no such Bible, by the way. This is an imaginary Bible, the new feeling version of the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through feeling, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Is that what the Bible says? Is salvation through feeling? No, the Bible actually says it this way. This is what the real scripture says. Ephesians 2.89, for by grace are you saved through what? Through faith. There are many people today, multitudes of Christians today, their religious life consists primarily of feelings. 
And if they don't feel wonderful, well, then there must be something wrong with me, or there must be something wrong with the church I'm going to, or there must be something wrong with the music, or there must be something wrong with the preacher, because I just don't come away from church feeling wonderful. That's not a safe emotion to follow when it comes to religion, feelings. Because, you know, your feelings are kind of like this. Sometimes you feel real good, and sometimes you're feeling pretty down. If you're going by your feelings, you're on a roller coaster, Walk by faith. The Bible tells us in Romans 1 verse 17, the just shall live by what? By faith. Don't trust your feelings. Trust in God. Have faith in God. How can I know that I've been forgiven when I confess my sins as God has instructed me to do to God? Then how can I know that I've been forgiven? What's the word? Feeling or faith? By faith. Because God promised it. That's how I know. Here's the text again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Did he lie? When God promises me that I'm forgiven when I confess, then am I forgiven? Yes or no? Yes, I am, even if I don't feel forgiven. You may not feel forgiven, but the promise is you are forgiven if you have done your part of confessing. If we confess, that's our part, there's a condition, if. If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now the good news is, generally, when you confess your sins to Jesus, generally there will be good feelings that follow. Let me show you a text where you have both the feeling and the faith in the same verse. But notice which one comes first, faith or feeling. Notice here, this is Romans 5 verse 1. Put that in your note today if you like. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by, what's the word? Faith. We have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace is a feeling. Which comes first, the faith or the feeling of peace? Faith comes first as a result of our faith, then we have peace with God, which is a wonderful feeling. Don't trust your feelings. Even if you don't feel peace, you believe that when you confess, God has forgiven you. But here's another question. Why do we need to confess to God? God can read my life as an open book. Why do I need to kneel down and tell God, all right, these are the things I did wrong today. Please forgive me. Why do I need to tell God, confess to God? Mark, this confession does not change God. Confession is to change who? To change you. Let me illustrate this way. Here's a picture of my sweetheart. My wife, this is some years ago when we were in Ukraine, working and doing seminars in Ukraine. Suppose some morning I get up and I'm grouchy. Happens occasionally. Maybe I get up on the wrong side of the bed. And I say some unkind words to my sweetheart. And I see that hurt look in her face. And I think the next instant, why did I say that? Did you ever do that? You ever say something and you wish the next instant you had it, said it? So I say something that I regret, and I see that hurt look in her face, and I think, oh, I wished I hadn't said that. So as I go through the day, as I go off to work, I'm thinking, I wished I had never kept open my mouth. I start to feel guilty. And so eventually I send up a prayer to God. I say, God, forgive me for those unkind, unchristian words that I spoke to my wife. And I determine as soon as I get back home, I'm going to confess to who else? Who else? To my wife. Why do I need to confess to my wife? To change her? <laughs> to change me. Confession accomplishes two things. You can mark these if you like. First of all, confession frees me from the condemnation of sin, the burden of guilt when I did wrong. And by the way, I'm not making up an imaginary story. I've often had to go to my wife and say, honey, I'm sorry for what I said. And my, my wife was a real sweetheart. She always is willing to forgive me. She puts her arms around me. She says, honey, I'm for, I forgive you. I told you I married the best woman in the world. Your preacher is not perfect. I have the closest thing to a perfect wife there is on earth, as far as I'm concerned. But she didn't get a perfect husband. So I confess to my wife. 
in order that I can be freed from the burden of condemnation and guilt. The second thing that a confession accomplishes, confession restores the broken relationship. When I said those cross words, those unkind words to my wife, that strained our marital relation. Confession then helps to restore the marital relation. What does sin do between us and God? Separates. What's confession then do? It restores us. It brings us back together. So confession is not intended to change God. Confession is intended to change us. It is God's appointed way for us to get rid of the burden of guilt. And that is why the Bible tells us in James 5, 16, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Not only do we need to confess our sins to God, but if we have wronged some person, then we should go to the person that we have wronged and ask them to forgive us as well. Only God can ultimately forgive sin. But when we have hurt somebody by what we said or did, then we are supposed to go to that person. The Bible actually instructs that. We're supposed to go to that person and ask them also to forgive us. That was confession. We looked at number one. These are the three conditions for forgiveness. Number one, repentance, sorrow for sin, forsaking sin. Number two, confession, to acknowledge wrong and ask for forgiveness. There is a third condition to having our sins forgiven. What's number three? Restitution. Number three, restitution. And you can read this in the Bible. We're not creating this idea. This is based on Scripture. Ezekiel thirty-three fifteen says, If the wicked restore the pledge... Give again that he had robbed. Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. So we have to restore what we have stolen or what we've wronged. For example, suppose I stole 10,000 pesos from you. And I start reading the Bible, perhaps. Or maybe I come to a prophecy lecture like this, perhaps. And I learn that stealing is sin. And so I start to feel guilty. I should never have stolen that 10,000 pesos. And ultimately, I kneel down. I say, dear God, please forgive me for my theft. And then I come to you. I say, I have a confession to make. I'm the one that stole that 10,000 pesos. You say, oh, you're the guilty guy, huh? I say, yeah, I, I've come today to ask for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? You probably think, well, maybe, but where's my 10,000 pesos? I said, oh, well, that's your problem. I spent the money already. I just want you to forgive me. Huh? Is that okay? No, you wouldn't forgive me? <laughs> you say, where's my money? I'm obligated to restore to you what I've stolen. Now, again, I'm not making up an imaginary story. Before I was a Christian, I was a thief. I became a Christian at this particular college. It was a Christian college. I went there because my parents that were Christian were urging me to go to a Christian school. I was not a Christian. And at this particular college, I was stealing like many students were doing. And one of the places that I was stealing from was the cafeteria. Stealing food. It was quite common. And I'm not going to tell you how I managed to do it. But there were many students that were stealing food. And I was one of them. Well, I became a Christian while I was at this college. I'm going to tell you that story in a future lecture sometime. But after I became a Christian accepted Jesus, I stopped stealing food. And then one day the Holy Spirit began speaking to me and said, Lowell, you ought to go pay for that food you stole. I thought, what? Pay? It's not hard to nail down and ask God to forgive you for your sins, but to make restitution is not easy. And the devil came along with all of his, his list of excuses. And they were pretty logical excuses. He told me they charged too much for the food at the cafeteria anyway. Most of the students felt that way. The prices of the food was too high, so we had to compensate by stealing some. And so the devil came along to rationalize with me and say, you know, they're charging too much food, so it's okay what you stole. Just don't steal anymore, and you're all right. But the Holy Spirit was there convicting me. I needed to pay for what I stole. Had no peace. And so finally, one day, I put some money in my pocket. It was quite a bit more than what I stole because I wanted to make sure I covered my bill and then some. 
And I set my feet to go to the cafeteria. I was living over here in the men's dormitory. You're seeing here in the photograph, this is the men's dormitory. The cafeteria was here in this complex. We would go in the, they had a door here behind this tree, and we'd go upstairs, and they would have the cafeteria over here where we would get our food, and this was the dining hall. We'd pay before we'd go out in the dining hall. So I went one day to the director of the cafeteria to pay for the food I stole. When I got to her office, my heart was pounding. My, uh, I had a big knot in my throat. My stomach was full of butterflies. I'd never been so nervous. You know what the devil told me? He said, oh, go back to your room and calm down. Sometimes you wish you could just tell the old devil, shut up and leave me alone. I knew if I went back to my room, I'd never come back to make restitution. So I went in with all, <laughs> with all of my nervousness. I went into the director's office. There was a the lady there by her desk, and I put the money on her desk. I said, ma'am, I've come to pay for the food I've stolen from the cafeteria. I forget exactly how I worded it, but that's what... I was essentially telling her. And she looked at me. She said, young man, since I've been the director of this cafeteria, I think you're the first young man that's ever done this. God is going to bless you for your faithfulness. When I went into her office, I was so nervous. When I walked out of her office, how do you think I felt? You talk about feelings. Now, if you want feelings, you can get feelings by making restitution. I walked out of her office that day. I felt like I'd just grown about a meter taller. Great burden of guilt had rolled off my shoulders. I had made restitution. Now I was not under the condemnation of the law. You know, the Bible talks about being under the law. So I was not under the law. Now I'm under grace. So I went back out to the cafeteria and I stole more food because I'm under grace now. You think? <laughs> not at all. I'm not a thief today. Thanks to God's grace. Don't let any Christian try to convince you that if you're under grace, you don't have to keep the commandments. That's a lie. I am not a thief because of God's grace. That's part of having your sins forgiven. Now, you probably can't go back into your life and make restitution for everything you ever did wrong. But where you can... And where the Holy Spirit convicts you. I told you one example. I had, there were many things that I had to go back and make right when I became a Christian. That I had done wrong. And God helped me in every situation. Where God convicts you to make restitution, that's part of having your sins forgiven. And where you can't make restitution, then you have to trust in the forgiveness of God. Maybe even make restitution for God, to God for what you can't restore to people. Those are the three conditions to having your sins forgiven. Number one, repentance. Number two, confession. And number three, restitution. That is the first of the great, the three great steps to heaven. Let's go on now to the second step. Step number one is having our sins forgiven. Step number two, the new birth. Jesus outlines this step for us in John 3, verse 3. Turn back in your Bible in the New Testament to John 3, verse 3. Jesus is speaking here to a religious leader, a Pharisee, church leader. And he says in John 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, that's Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be, what's the words? Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you want to enter heaven, the kingdom of God, you must be what? Born again. How are we to experience being born again? Go down to verse 5. John 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of, of what? Of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we must be born of water. What's that represent? That symbolizes baptism. But we must also be born of the Spirit. What's that represent? That represents conversion, and conversion must take place before baptism. How are we to be born of the Spirit? You can read the answer from John 1, verses 12 and 13. That's just a couple pages back. John 1, verses 12 and 13. If you'd like to be born of the Spirit, here's how it happens. 
John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, which were born. Here it is, born of the Spirit. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born of God or born of the Spirit. How does it happen? When we receive who? When we receive Jesus, then we are born of the Spirit, which brings us to the question, how are we to receive Jesus? It's actually quite simple. You can read the answer from Revelation 3.20. Put that in your notes if you like. Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and do what? Open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The door is your choice. When you kneel in prayer or wherever you are in prayer, you invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Then you are being born of the Spirit. Not my will, but thy will be done. To allow God to direct your life, to surrender all your known choices to God, to Jesus, and invite him to be your master, your Lord, your Savior. That's what it means to be born of the Spirit. But that's only one part of the new birth. We have to be born of the Spirit, yes, but we must also be born of, born of water, which is symbolic of baptism. And that is why Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth, there's one part, accepting Jesus, believing in Jesus, he that believeth and is baptized, there's the second part, shall be saved. So when a person receives Jesus as their personal Savior and then takes the step of water baptism, then they have been born again. That's the new birth which is what is the second great step to heaven. Step number one, having our sins forgiven. Step number two, the new birth. And moving on now to the final of the three great steps to heaven. Number three, following Jesus in, in what? Loving obedience. Notice that it's called loving obedience. That's the only kind of obedience that God will accept. Loving obedience. But that brings us to the question, why should we obey? Do we obey Jesus to earn our salvation? Can you earn salvation? You, the only thing you can earn is death. Here's what you earn. Romans 6, 23, for the wages, that's your earning. The wages of sin is death. So the only thing you can earn is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. If you earn it, is it a gift? If you earn it, is it a gift? No. If it's a gift, then you didn't earn it, suppose. Your employer were to hand you your paycheck and say, and says, here's a gift. Is that a gift? No, you earn that money. So if we earn salvation, it would no longer be a gift. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that of yourselves, that not of yourselves, it is the what? What's the word? Gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you cannot earn your salvation. Salvation is a free gift. Since we cannot earn salvation by obeying God, then why should we even try to obey God? Jesus answers that for us. John 14, verse 15, read with me. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why do we obey Jesus? Because we, what's the word? Because we love him. Jesus Christ is to be both our Savior and our Lord. Do you know the difference? The Savior is the one who saves me from sin. The Lord is the, some, is the person I obey. There are many Christians, they want Jesus as Savior, but they don't want him as, as Lord. They don't want to obey him. If Jesus is not your Lord, he cannot be your Savior either. He must be both Savior and Lord. If we were to go back to the days of Adam and Eve, how were Adam and Eve to show their love and loyalty to God? How? By obedience. 
right? They were not to eat from that one tree. That was their act of obedience to show they were loyal to God. Why were Adam and Eve sent out of the Garden of Eden? What for? For disobedience. Since God did not allow disobedience to stay in Eden, do you think he's going to allow it to enter heaven? Not at all. And that's why we read in Revelation 21, 27, And there shall in no wise enter into it, the holy city, anything that defileth. Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that's obedience, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You cannot earn your salvation, but if you're unwilling to obey God, you can't be saved either. We show our love for God by obeying him, not to earn salvation. Hebrews 5, 9 says he, that's Jesus, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that, what's the word? Obey him. Jesus saves those who obey him. We don't obey him to earn salvation. We obey him because we're saved, because we love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. By his death on the cross, Jesus provides us with two things. First of all, he provides forgiveness for sins. Secondly, he provides victory or power over sin. There is a Christian hymn that goes sort of like this. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the... Oh, you know the song. In the blood. Is there power in the blood? Is there enough power in the blood of Christ to give me victory over sin? Oh, yes. Jesus provides that power. So let's, for a few moments, consider how to be victorious. I suppose everybody, at some point in their experience, tries to gain the victory over some bad habit. You can think of your bad habit, whatever that is. This, for the sake of example, let's just think of smoking. We're not picking on smokers here. We're just using this as an example. I have met people who smoke, and they say, I'm going to try to quit. A few weeks later, I ask him, well, how are you doing? I say, well, I'm still trying. You know why trying usually doesn't work? Because the devil is stronger than you are. And even those who manage to quit smoking in their own strength after, you know, when they come into a crisis, some bad thing happens in their life, what do they do? They go right back to smoking. Crisis takes them right back. Other people I meet, they say, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quit smoking, and the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to taper off on my smoking. I'm going to smoke less and less and less until finally I quit. That's just a sure way to keep smoking. The Bible never talks about tapering off on sin. Let me give you an example. There was a woman that was brought to Jesus who had been caught in the act of sin, the act of adultery. What did Jesus tell that woman? Go taper off on your sin. Go commit adultery a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less until finally you quit. Is that what Jesus said? No, what did he say? Go and sin no more. And in the power of Jesus Christ, that woman, she began a victorious life. So we want to consider today how to be victorious. The five keys to victory. And I think you received as you came in a five step card. Did you get this card? Did anybody not get one of these cards? If you didn't, we have more. Maybe we could have our helpers pass these. That's the five steps to victory card. I have a different card we'll give you later, but for now, helpers, the card we want to pass now for those who raise their hands is the five steps to victory card. So don't give the wrong card. If you didn't get the five steps to victory card, then we will pass that to you. Five keys to victory. This is not the trying method. This is not the tapering off method. This is the trusting method. Five keys, five steps to victory. And you don't have to take notes because we gave you the card that has those five steps. Step number one, this is on your card. Everybody have a card? The five steps to victory card. Make sure, helpers, that you're passing the right card. We don't want to pass out the other card. Number five, or number one, here are the five steps. Number one, we must accept victory as a gift. Our text, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, which says, 
But thanks be to God, which, what's the word? Giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So victory is a gift that God will give you. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It doesn't depend on your power. God will what? He'll give it to you. Question, can anybody accept a gift? Anybody that's willing to take it. And that is why any person can be victorious. Victory is not dependent upon your power. God will give you the victory. And when you begin to realize that this victory is a gift from God, it changes your perspective. So number one, victory is a gift. We must accept victory not as something we earn, but something that God will give us. Second step to victory, you have to ask. If you want victory over some bad habit, number two, you must ask God for the victory. Our text, Matthew 7, verse 11. You have it here on the card. This card has those five steps to victory, and with each one it has the text. Number two, ask for the victory. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that what? That ask him. If you want victory, you have to ask God for it. Now here, I want to express a word of caution. Be careful what you ask God for. Because if it's good for you, the promise from Jesus is if we ask God for good things, what will God do? He'll give them to us. So be careful what you ask for. And secondly, make sure that what you're asking God for is what you really want. Do you really want victory? For example, I have met people who were smoking. And I've asked those people, have you ever thought about quitting? They say, oh, yeah, I thought about quitting. I say, would you like to quit? They say, yeah, I'd like to quit. I said, are you sure you want to quit? Oh, yes, I'm sure, I'm sure I want to quit. And I say, well, I could share with you a five-minute plan, a five-step plan whereby you could stop smoking right now. And they give me this, I wished I'd never met you kind of look. And they say, yeah, I want to quit, but not now. I want to quit, but not today. <laughs> Do you really want victory? Make sure you really want victory over that sin before you ask God for it. Because if it's good for you, God's going to give it to you. Now, of course, the key element is faith. You must believe that God is going to give you the victory that you're asking for. You're not trusting in your feelings. You believe by faith that God will put in you a reservoir of power so that you have the power to quit. You may not feel anything. In fact, you might even be tempted. Not a sin to be tempted. We're, tr we're trusting in God by faith. Yeah, there's the, there's the point. Not a, a smoker, for example, may have, a, when he asks God for victory, he may have a craving for tobacco after he claims victory. That's not sin. When you're tempted, that's not sin. It's when you take that cigarette in your, in your fingers and you light the other end. It's going to get in your mouth then. <laughs> That's when sin takes place, when you actually act it out. So it's not a sin to be tempted. We trust that God will give us the victory that we are asking for, which brings us to step number three. Five steps to victory. Number three, believe that God has given you the victory that you've asked for. And our text is Romans 6, verse 11, which says, Likewise reckon, that word is an old English word that means believe. Likewise, believe you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I believe that now that sin is dead. If I used to be a smoker, I tell people I'm, not, I'm a non-smoker now. I ask God for victory. I believe he gave it to me. So I don't smoke. I'm a non-smoker. God gave me the gift, the victory that I've asked for. When someone gives you a gift, what do you usually tell them? What's the expression? Thank you. Or maybe thank you very much. And so as you ask God for victory, you believe that God gives you the victory over that bad habit. Then what do you tell God in prayer? Thank you, God, for giving me the victory over tobacco or alcohol or gossip or appetite, whatever it is. 
Thank you for giving me that victory. I believe that God gives me the victory that I'm asking for. That's number three. Let's go to number four. Number four, make no provision to fail. Romans 13, 14, make no provision for the flesh. Here's the text, Romans 13, 14. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If a person has a problem with some sin, then what they have to do is eliminate the temptation. For example, a person that's got a problem with pornography on the internet, what should they do with their internet service? Disconnect your internet. You're better off with no email than lose your soul. Whatever that sin is, cut it off. Make no provision for the flesh. For example, if you've got a problem with, with tobacco, what should you do with your cigarettes? What? Here's what some people do. Let's just imagine this is my pack of cigarettes. And they say, well, I, I'm going to quit smoking. I've decided I'm going to quit. So they take their pack of cigarettes and they take it over and they put it in the cabinet, maybe behind the dishes. They say, I quit. But just in case. What have they done? They have made provision to fail. And the next morning they wake up and they're having this, this hangover because of the withdrawal of nicotine. It's like, where is those cigarettes? Oh, yes, I remember where I put them. I've seen it happen many times. People try to quit smoking and they hide a pack of cigarettes out in their car if they have a car or maybe under the bed or in some secret place. I'm going to quit, but just in case, I make provision. Don't make provision to fail. If you've got a problem with alcohol, what should you do with your wine, your alcohol, your bar at home? I know one young man, after he heard this lecture, he went home. He poured out 40 bottles of rare, expensive European champagne. He wanted to have victory over alcohol. So he poured the, flushed the devil down the toilet. He poured it down the drain. I know another man. This was a church leader. I was in Europe. You know, the Europeans, they, they really have a problem with alcohol. The, many of the Eastern Europeans are at the top of the list for consumption of alcohol. I was in Hungary, and I had a man come to me who had a problem with wine, the alcoholic kind of wine. This man was a church leader. And I might mention, if you want us to pray with you for victory over your bad habit, we'd be happy to do that. We often do that. I've done that with scores of people. So this man, he had made an appointment with me to meet me, and we were going to go through the five steps together and claim victory over his problem. So we made the appointment. He came, and we were going through the, the five steps. This man, by the way, was a, an elder in a church. Found out he was an elder in a Seventh-day Adventist church. But he had a problem. He was making his own wine. He had a grape vineyard there, and he, I guess in his property. And so he was, he was making his own alcohol, his own wine. But he wanted to quit. And so he came, and we were going through the list. And as we got down to number four, make no provision to fail, I asked this brother, I said, Brother, will you be willing to make the commitment today to go home and pour out all of your wine? His head went down. He would not look at me for the rest of the visit. <laughs> he refused to make a decision to get rid of his, his wine. You think he ever gained the victory over that? Probably not. Make no provision for the flesh. Get rid of those things that have been leading you into sin. Another illustration. Let me illustrate this way. I heard the story of little Johnny who got in trouble for swimming when his mother told him not to go swimming. And when he came home with wet hair, Johnny's mother said, Johnny, why did you disobey me? I told you not to go swimming today. And John, Johnny said, well, uh, 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 Mama, uh, uh, I got tempted. Mother, mother said to Jimmy, yeah, Jimmy, don't tell me that. I saw you when you left the house this morning. You took your swimsuit with you. And Johnny said, well, Mama, I was expecting to get tempted. He was making provision for disobedience. Make no provision to fail. That's number four. <clears throat> Let's go to number five now. This is the power step. 
You can keep this card, by the way, and I would encourage you to circle number five. That's where the power comes from for victory, the power step. Watch and pray. Our text is Matthew 26, verse 41, which says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you found that to be true in your own life? You want to quit. You want to have victory over some bad habit, but you have weak flesh. Jesus here gives a solution. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. So you need to, what's he say? Watch and pray. That means to study your Bible and pray. You can't pray and sin at the same time. Watch and pray. The Bible says in Psalms 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Fill your mind with the power of God's word. Then when you're tempted, when Jesus was tempted, how did he defend himself? He said, it is written. Matthew 4, verse 4. If you will fill your mind with scripture, that will be a defense against the devil's temptations. So watch and pray. That means to study your Bible and pray. That will close a thousand doors of temptation for you. We have today discovered the three steps to heaven. Number one, having your sins forgiven by repentance, confession, restitution. Number two, the new birth as we receive Jesus and take the step of water baptism. And then number three, following Jesus in loving obedience. And we have found today the five keys for victorious Christian living. Number one, victory is a gift. Number two, ask for the victory. Number three, believe that God gives you the victory. Number four, make no provision to fail. And number five, watch and pray. As you go through these five steps and claim victory in your life over some bad habit, suppose you slip, suppose you fail, should you give up? Put down a text in your notes. You can mark this in your notes. Micah 7 verse 8. Micah 7, verse 8, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. I'll get back up. Let me illustrate this way. Did you ever get in the shower? And you're washing yourself, and somehow the bar of soap slips out of your hands, and it goes crashing to the floor. What do you do? You pull back the shower curtain. You say, it's no use. I can't even hold the soap. I'm quitting. I give up. Is that what you do? Step out of the shower and you just give up. I can't wash myself. I can't even hold the soap, so I'm quitting. Is that what you do? Of course not. You bend over, you pick up that bar of soap, and you go right back to washing. And it's the same spiritually. If you fail, don't give up. Bend over, get down on your knees, and say, Dear God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Go back through the five steps. You can live the victorious Christian life. Jesus wants to give you victory. He has the power. Victory is a gift, number one. Number two, you have to ask for it. Number three, you have to believe that God will give it to you. Number four, make no provision to fail. And number five, watch and pray. Our helpers have another card we're going to pass to you right now. I'd like to have our helpers pass that other card. This, is the, this card is called the Three Steps to Heaven. And on this card, there are some boxes that you can check if you'd like for a group of people to pray for you, that God empower you to give you victory over some bad habit. You can check that box. There's a place there for your name. And we will pray for you. So let's have our helpers pass this card. And I would invite you to take one of these cards. I don't know if we have, do we have extra pens? I don't know if our helpers have a pen in the basket. If you need a pen, maybe you can ask them for an extra pen or pencil or borrow one from your neighbor. If you're sitting at the edge of an aisle, they probably will pass you a stack of cards. So just take the first card that's there in the stack and you can pass the stack down to those beside you. That way everybody can have one. Take a stack, take one, pass the rest on. Does everyone have a card now? 
Who doesn't yet have cards? Okay, I see some hands back there. Just hold your hand up if you don't have. Maybe they're coming across. The first card that we gave you, the five-step card, is for you to keep. You can mark that one if you like. Put down your name and the date that you claim victory in your life over whatever the bad habit is. This card we're gonna, we will collect. This is so that we can pray for you, that God give you the strength for victory. So the first card, the one you received as you came in, that's for you to keep. This card we're passing you now is for us. We're going to collect the card after we go through this together. Put your name on the card, first of all. If you'd like to put down your phone number and your address, you can also do that. The first box says, please pray that God will give me victory over. And then there's a selection of things. If it's tobacco, you can check tobacco. If it's alcohol, you can check that box. If you'd like to write in something, there's a blank where you can write in some bad habit you want to specifically ask. Prayers that God give you victory over. Or if it's something you'd rather be unspoken, you can check that one as well. So please pray for me that God will give me victory over. If you check that first box, then check one of the ones below that. What it is, you're asking God to give you victory over. The second line says, please pray that I will give my heart fully to Jesus and be baptized soon. We haven't really studied in our seminar about baptism much. We just touched on it today. But if that's something you're thinking about in the future, then you can put a check in that second line there. Please pray that I will give my heart fully to Jesus and be baptized soon. The third line, the last line, I would like a personal visit to claim victory over a bad habit. If you'd like for us to meet with you, personally, over some bad habit in your life, and we can pray together that God give you the victory over that bad habit, then check that last box and be sure and give us, provide us with your phone number so that we can set up an appointment to meet you. We're going to sing a one stanza of the song, I will, all to Jesus, I surrender. If you need a little more time to finish your card, then take that time while we sing the first stanza. We won't collect the cards just yet. We'll collect them. You, you can be seated. We're not going to stand for the song. If you need a little more time to finish your card, take the time while we sing the first stanza. And then when we start the second stanza, we will begin collecting the cards. Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender. Before we sing the next stanza, I'd like you to turn your card over and pass it out to one of the aisles. We have helpers here with baskets that will collect your cards. We want to pray for your request for victory in your life. And as they collect those cards, you can just pass them across to the aisles. We'll continue singing. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee Blessed Savior, I surrender all. All 
to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender. I surrender, now I feel the sacred flame, oh, the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to his name, I surrender. Let's stand together and we will sing this chorus once more. I'd like our helpers to bring all the cards forward while we sing this uh, refrain once more. I want to pray for those decisions. I surrender. have all the cards let's bow our heads as we pray our dear heavenly father we thank you that through Jesus we can experience victory in our individual lives we thank you for these three simple steps to heaven and we can have our sins forgiven as we repent and confess and restore. We're thankful that we can begin a new life with Jesus. as We accept him as our personal Savior and take the step of baptism. And we thank you that you've given us these simple steps to victory. We acknowledge victory as a gift that you offer. And just now we ask for victory in the life of each person that's made request here on these cards. And because you have promised that if we would ask, you would grant us victory, we believe, Lord, you've given us the victory that we've asked for. Help us to make no provision to fail. Help us each day to watch and pray that we enter not into temptation. We ask as we leave this place that it might be with a sense of your power in our lives. Because we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Tonight, join us at 6.30 for our song time. And our topic at 7 will be the mysteries of the mummies. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.